a lot has changed in the last couple of years and this is my current new workflow where I change my zoom lenses into primes and primes to super primes. I already have my camera connected and uh, we'll just import the macro session that I did today. I'm using a macro session because that gives us more details on clean shots. As discussed earlier, the options on the right, I make a second copy to a different location. I use an import preset, I rename files and I create a structure which I follow, which is essentially date and month and day wise. So we just import this. And while the files are importing, let's discuss a bit more on the zoom to prime and prime to super prime. Now, once I've imported these files, my preset, the import preset no longer applies any sharpening or noise reduction in Lightroom since that is no longer required. DxO Pure Raw, which came out about a year or so ago, does all the heavy lifting for noise reduction, sharpening, and as a side effect, enhances the contrast as well. And that is the primary difference between a zoom and a prime lens. You get more contrast, you get sharper images, and you get lesser noise. DxO Pure Raw takes all the hard work away from you, makes it a no-brainer. So you do not need to fiddle around with noise reduction and sharpening as you would in almost every image. I have yet to come across uh, any exceptions where uh, DxO Pure Raw actually uh, does a bad job. But because these are AI and processor intensive applications, you would not want to send the entire lot of your shoot to these applications. So ideally you would cull out your images and send only the ones that you are going to keep to DxO Pure Raw to process. Okay. So that's the zoom to prime. Now that we have the prime, how do we make it a super prime? Okay. The super prime comes from Topaz AI tools. And the primary one there that I use is Sharpen AI. Now Sharpen AI, I would recommend for every macro shot. It makes a world of a difference as we will see shortly. Once we have these files imported, culled out, and then we will start the DxO process to process all our culled files or rather the keepers. And you'll see the kind of time it can take depending on the number of files, the speed of your system, your graphics card and so on. So once I've culled out the collection, there are a couple of ways of running DxO on it. DxO version 2 actually adds a plugin for Lightroom, so which you can use to run DxO from Lightroom itself. But because of the processor intensive nature of these applications, I prefer to close down everything else when I'm running DxO Pure Raw. Let's see how I do it. Okay, so I have culled out as I would generally uh, any uh, imported session. I will delete all the files that are rejected. And as I mentioned, you can actually process from within Lightroom. Just go to the file menu, plug in extras and look up process with DxO Pure Raw. So Pure Raw will take up some time to start, but at the same time, the thing to mention here is that the options in the Pure Raw, as we see here, do not need to be changed at all, regardless of how you process it. So basically everything remains the same. You just click OK. Now how I would do it is I would go to the folder where the files are currently. I just right click on the image and show in Finder in case of a Mac or Explorer in Windows and I quit Lightroom. So once Lightroom is out of the way, I just run DxO Pure Raw. <laughs> that is version 2 for now. And I just go back to the folder and drag and drop the entire folder onto DxO PR. Now all I need to do is click on process photos. Nothing here needs to be changed at all. 
So this will create a folder called DXO inside the folder that we dragged and dropped. So we will have all the DXO processed files in there. If you do not want to see the processed files, just click on unprocessed on the top here. And only the files to be processed and under processing will show up. Now that we are done with processing almost, DXO will show us a couple of options as to what we want to do after the processing has been completed. Although it still shows 46 seconds, it's done. Now we can either view the results or export to Lightroom. We're not going to do that. And this is exactly what we've already discussed. So we press OK here. And since the processing for DXO is done, let's take a look at the folder structure. You have the DXO folder that it's created with the process digital negative or DNG files. Normally, I would just delete all the raw files, put the DXO files back and synchronize those in Lightroom. But since we want to see a comparison here, I will just restore those and go back to Lightroom, synchronize the entire thing so we can see the DXO files and the normal raw files side by side before we actually remove the raw files and keep only the DXO processed files. So once Lightroom has started up, we will go to the folder that we just imported the files to and that's the 18th and we have the DXO folder within that so we will just synchronize because we have another 84 processed files in there. So we will synchronize this and that will allow us to see the files side by side. Since we've already applied a preset we don't need to do that anymore. So also for the camera settings nothing needs to be applied we just import. Once the import is done it's just being added to the same folder and all the thumbnails are created. Once the previews are built, we will see them side by side and I will just speed up the preview building process so we don't need to spend any time on that. Okay, so the previews are more or less done. And we'll take a look at a new Lightroom bug. Supposedly all previews are built, but if we say build previews, and build all for the folder, it will start rebuilding. This is a new bug introduced in 11.4. Just good to be aware of because the previews will actually determine whether or not you color an image. And it might be painful to find out later that the image was good enough to keep and not cull just because the preview wasn't built. It's just something to be aware of. It does not make a huge difference because once you go into the develop mode, it will process and build the preview anyway. But good to be aware of if you're not going into the develop mode where it will force a rebuild of the preview. There are some issues with previews currently. Hopefully they'll be fixed soon. But like I said, it's good to know. Now that the previews are really built, Let's run the process again just to verify and make sure you go into previews, build standard size, build all and done. That's it. Anyway, that's a bug. Hopefully will be fixed soon. To the comparison, we will take a look at some of the images side by side. The actual raw files versus the DXO pure raw processed files. The file name on top will show us which file it is. This is the deep prime the DXOPR one versus the raw file. As you can see, there's a difference in contrast, sharpness and noise. Although these are macro shots, we have perfect lighting. Uh, this is another example. It's not a macro shot, but it's from a prime lens. And you can actually see the difference because DXO Pure Raw also fixes for lens profile. It will correct distortions in the image besides the sharpening and noise reduction. So it's a no brainer actually. You just run your images through DXOPR and most images that are okay uh, exposure wise, shot wise, you will not have to do much excepting for the basic tonal adjustments for raw files within Lightroom, which is required. Although we could bump up the texture and clarity in Lightroom as we used to, but DxOPR does a far, far superior job 
and we do not need to spend any time on that. That is also another reason why we disable lens profile corrections because it's already been done. So we do not need any sharpening, noise reduction or lens correction excepting for removal of chromatic aberration which can remain on. As you can see this is the normal raw file versus the processed file at a 400% magnification. Look at the difference between the noise and the sharpening at 400%. That's really amazing. You don't need to do anything. Regardless of which image you choose to look at, you will always see that difference. This is the deep prime image processed from DxO Pure Raw. And if you look at the same actual raw file, this is what we see. And if we move out to areas where you actually have noise, let's say in the background, you can actually see the difference far more clearly. This is at 400%. This is deep prime. And we'll do the same for the normal raw image. This is the raw image. I think at 400% this is visible enough even on the video. So once we are done with this, let's take another look as to how to take this further. How to change a prime into a super prime. Before we get into the super prime area, let's just do some housekeeping and clean up the raw files. We just go into metadata, select file type, select raw. So we only have the raw files showing the only the NEF files. We select all of them, reject and delete. That way we are left only with the DNG files that have been processed from DXOPR in that folder. Now we can move these files back to the top level folder. It's going to move these files and we can remove the DXO folder right from here. Okay, so besides this, we would also like to tag and set our location, etc. on all these images. One thing that I do personally is I rename all the files to a standard format. So I just click on this, select my file naming which is similar to this. Click OK, all the files are renamed. The next step from here is changing all the keywords and adding a location. Since most of this has been covered in earlier videos, I will simply speed up the process of adding the location to all images and then keywording those and then we move on to all the raw adjustments that we will do within Lightroom before we go on to the process of changing our prime to a super prime lens. With the location and keywords done, we will simply do the raw processing and finally move on to the next step. On this sample image, we press a command E or control E in Windows to take it to Photoshop. From where we will use the Topaz Sharpen AI to change our prime to a super prime lens. As usual, we make a copy of the layer first, a command zero to fit in window. We go into the filters menu from there and Topaz Labs and Sharpen AI. Now this is also processor intensive. So you only need to do this for images that you really want to. Takes a while to start up and then of course processing will take some time. Now once you have Sharpen AI running, there's a comparison view mode where you can select up to four different algorithm views. And the moment you move anything, it'll start to recompute all of that. So we'll select this subject I and look at all the four methods and then figure out whichever one looks best to us. This might be something that you need to work with. A bit of experience will tell you which algorithm will suit a particular image better. It's not always the case that you select uh, the automatic selection mode in Topaz tools, any of them, and you'll get the right model. That's mostly not going to happen, especially for wildlife. 
So once you've gotten all of these, we select out of focus very blurry in this particular case. And it'll take a while to process and get back to Photoshop from there. Just be careful which model you choose. There are subtle differences which you can always zoom into and figure out whichever one looks best for your particular image. So once the processing is done, we can see the before and after within Photoshop, which will give us a better view. We enable the background layer again, zoom in a bit. We are now at a 300% zoom. So maybe just back off a bit. 300 is a bit too much. And now if I disable the topaz layer and re-enable it, you can see the difference between the before and after. It's a huge difference. And that's why I said you can change your prime lens into a super prime because this is shot with a prime macro lens. And of course you can plug in your adjustments. You do an option auto on the curves, figure out which particular option works best for your image. And that's about it. You do all the stuff you normally would uh, to clean up or make tonal adjustments in Photoshop or do whatever, uh, compositing, etc, etc. Hardly matters. That remains the same. The difference is you've changed your zoom into a prime and a prime to a super prime. And once you save the image, make sure that you enable the zip for layers if you're using layers. Otherwise, the file size will increase substantially. So once we are done in Photoshop, Lightroom will have these images stacked for us, the original as well as the processed one from Photoshop. And we can see those side by side. So the images are stacked. We just change the info. This is the TIFF file from Photoshop. And this is the DXOPR processed file. You can see, I think, even on the video, the difference in the sharpness. So that's about it. And we can do a comparison view. Take a look side by side. So the zoom and the images are locked. And as you can see, there is more than just a perceptible difference after Topaz Sharpen. Okay, so all very nice. What's the catch? Well, there is a catch. And there is a workaround for it for most people. Let's take a look at that. Okay, so the first thing is the file size. You can see the file size on the right panel if you customize the metadata panel, which I have done. So let's take a look at the file sizes. The files processed from DXO Pure RAW on an average will be two to three times your RAW file size, which means your space requirements actually double, if not triple. And that can cause issues, not just with storage, also with performance, load times and processing times. So, if you're really, really, really a perfectionist, you would need to work with that. For the rest of us, as long as we are using images for the web, it's not going to make a difference as to what we do with them next. We can reduce the file size substantially using the Adobe DNG converter and using the lossy compression in there. So I selected the current folder that we've just imported and worked with. We'll output to the same location. Although you can change the document name, add a prefix, suffix to make it easier as that is purely a personal choice. I leave it at the same because I do that manually outside Lightroom and then I simply synchronize within Lightroom or re-import depending on the scenario. But you have these options. You can put in uh, numbering or whatever in the document name, the converted document name. I simply leave it to the same, the default, because 
the converter does append a digit to it. Now if we go into preferences, I generally keep it to the latest or later. I also include a full size JPEG preview and then this is the critical one, the lossy compression, preserve pixel count. Once you've done that, that's all you need to do. The processing for the converter is pretty fast. It's going to convert and put the files in the same directory because that's what we've chosen. Once this has been processed, let's take a look at the difference in the, not just in the file size, but also in the quality of the images. Because this is a lossy conversion, which means it will lose some detail. So now, how you get these files back into Lightroom is a matter of choice. Personally, I've started using the compressed files. What I generally would do is either sort by the modified date, delete all the raw files, because they're not actually raw, we can't do the metadata fix that we did earlier when we converted with DXO Pure Raw, because these are all DNGs. So I simply delete make sure the number matches the difference in one is because of the tiff that we made from photoshop so i can delete all of these if i want i can simply rename the compressed dngs after this uh, on a mac you could simply select all of these and do a right click and rename uh, underscore one with nothing but you have to make sure that there's no other underscore one as there is in this case so the rename will not be as expected but i can always import these files back and apply my exif rename preset to get them into the naming format that i want and use but we're not going to do that for now because all we want to do is figure out the difference we're not going to put in any preset or whatever because that's already there we only want to see the difference between the TIFF that we created from the original file created by DXO Pure Raw versus the compressed one, which is a fraction of the size. So let's speed up all of this process, go into Photoshop with the file, the compressed one this time, apply exactly the same uh, settings and presets, and then come back into Lightroom and look at them side by side. Now we are back into Lightroom. We have the processed files from both the kinds of raw files, the DNGs. And let's take a look, a closer look. Now keep in mind, these are sharp macros. And I think the difference might just be perceptible even on the video. I'm just toggling between the two tips. You might see some change, but like I said earlier, there is practically no difference when you're using these lossy compressed DNGs if you're only going to share and post to the web. Even for print, it would not really make a huge difference. Since I don't need these tips anymore, I'm just going to delete them because the process that we wanted to look at is done. Now, we just optimize the catalog. This will improve performance of Lightroom because we've done so many operations on the files, importing, deleting and so on. We just optimize the catalog and make sure that we have a perfectly functional optimized catalog for Lightroom. So Lightroom will start on its own or rather restart on its own once it's optimized the catalog. And that's my current workflow and we are done with the process. I will get into more detail with the Topaz tools and uh, DxO Pure Raw in uh, upcoming videos. Hopefully we can cover a lot more detail that I have learned in the last couple of years in those videos. That's it for now. Have fun. Till the next one.